Good afternoon and good evening to everybody around the planet. Uh, my name is Jeff Edgar and I'm owner of Silver Creek Nurseries in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. I'm a longtime uh, tree fund supporter and I also ride in the Tour de Trees. Uh, I also ask that uh, we thank Virginia chapter of ASLA for partnering with this webinar and for sponsoring the LACES credits. Next. Tree Fund was established in 2002 with a mission to support scientific discovery and dissemination of new knowledge in the fields of arboriculture and urban forestry. We advance our mission by issuing research grants, primarily applied research in how to better plant, propagate, and care for urban trees, provide scholarships to students in arboriculture, urban forestry, horticulture, and related, funding education for K through 12 related to trees and environmental stewardship. Since 2002, the Tree Fund has awarded over $4 million for our research and education grants. Next. To see all the research we funded through the years, I encourage you go, to go to the research archives page of our website, which is treefund.org. You can search by keyword or scientist name, and we have compiled lists of, of research projects funded most recently. After exploring our archives, you can also find other information about the Tree Fund on our website, including our upcoming webinar schedule and info on events like the Tour de Trees. Next. During the most recent ISA conference, we held an informal survey asking the question, which area of research is most vital to you? Soil, the root and soil management received the most votes and remains the top research priority for our community. We are actively raising funds for the Tree and Soil Research Fund, and we listen to you and will always be sure Tree Fund's research priorities reflect what is important to you. For more information about the Tree and Soil Research Fund, please visit our website again, treefund.org. Next. Today's speakers, we have Jim Urban of he specializes in design of urban trees and soils and has lectured and written extensively on this subject, including his book, Up By Roots. He's a recipient of the ISA Award of Achievement and the ASLA Medal of Excellence for his long-term contributions to the profession. And Jim is also a Tour de Trees writer. Paul Josie, our other speaker today co-founded Wolf Josie Landscape Architects and leads a diverse range of commercial, civic, academic, and institutional projects, primarily throughout the Mid-Atlantic region. His particular knowledge in urban and campus design, construction, soils, native plants, and rainwater use. Paul received his bachelor's degree in landscape architecture from the University of Maryland and completed his postgraduate work in landscape architecture at the University of Virginia. Hi, uh, this is Jim Urban, and we're going to be uh, talking about what what does a landscape architect do when he gets or she gets in the nursery. Um, and this is a critical point where we're selecting the trees, but also enforcing um, our specifications. Next. Uh, so the, the key points we're going to be going over, we're going to talk about the role of, of you, the landscape architect. Uh, look at different uh, kinds of root packages, um, uh, and then talk about B and B trees, um, both above the line, the soil line and below, and then look at container trees, um, uh, which are their own special category with their own special set of issues. Next. So one of the things that I've observed over, over the, the last 40 years um, is that landscape architects as a profession generally work to the warranty, that when we finish the warranty, our work is basically done um, contractually, um, but is that really the end of our responsibility? Because we uh, essentially the trees get put on the other side of the warranty wall um, and somebody else picks up uh, the maintenance and, and long-term care of this uh, and is our job done when that happens? 
Um, or, or is it? Uh, next, next slide. So here are two examples of trees that failed. Um, and they began their failure point um, before the warranty period. They actually began their failure point in the nursery. Uh, so a tree that split down the middle, and you can see the, the, um, the, the brown streak uh, in the tree on the, on the left. Um, and that brown wood represents um, included bark uh, from a co-dominant leader that was right where the tree broke off. Uh, which was approximately the top of the tree on the day it was planted. Uh, so that co-dominant leader was left there by the landscape architect. Um, and then the other trees which are falling over are falling over because of stem girdling roots uh, that existed in the tree uh, the day it was planted. So they came from the nursery um, uh, and in my opinion should have been the landscape architect's responsibility uh, to make sure that those girdling roots um, were not there. Uh, next slide. So when we, our, our responsibility certainly includes the preparation of specifications. Um, hopefully we're still doing nursery inspection and tagging, although I know even a lot of projects we don't get to do that. And we also do project site reviews, um, hopefully, and I know in a lot of projects we don't even get to do that. But these last two, the nursery inspection and the project site reviews are really critical to the success of the project and enforcing the specifications. Next slide. Um, so you, you need to start with a good set of specifications. Um, a number of years ago, um, I, uh, with uh, a number of other people, prepared a set of spe specifications for the Urban Tree um, Foundation. Um, and this is a really good set to use as your base specification if you're not already using it. Um, you can get it at urbantree.org. Um, and not only is it a set of amendable uh, Word, uh, Microsoft Word specifications, but they're also about 50 uh, DWG details that you can um, access uh, for free um, uh, at the same website that you get the specifications. Next slide. So when we do our nursery inspections, most of us uh, frankly look at the top of the tree. We try to pick trees that look beautiful. Um, and we don't spend a lot of time um, below the ground. Um, so we, we need to be looking above the ground and below the ground. And we need to be looking at both aesthetic requirements and technical requirements. Um, so even above the ground, we need to find those co-dominant leaders, which I'll get into in a minute. Uh, we need to find girdling roots. We need to find out if the tree is too deep. There, there are lots and lots of reasons, um, uh, things that we have to look at when we're tagging trees. Next. Next slide. Um, and again, the oops, can go back. Um, not sure. So the, the landscape architect is increasingly missing at the site review period. Um, and if you're not there um, uh, at uh, critical points, a lot of things you can't see or change or fix after the tree is installed. Um, and it's really important for us as a profession to fight to uh, retain those uh, project site review um, uh, uh, fees so, so we can uh, work um, on, on our projects and, and see them uh, done correctly. Uh, next slide. So the first thing we're going to talk about is bald and burlap. Um, and I put in trees and shrubs here. Uh, essentially, we're going to be talking about trees, but everything we're going to talk about applies also to shrubs. Um, so don't think that you're off the hook if you're just uh, tagging shrubs. You've still got to be uh, looking for uh, these particular issues. Next slide. So there, there are All many. Right. Yep. And Paul's going to take, take, take over at this point. <laughs> Go ahead, Paul. <laughs> Jim's done this presentation so many times, he's ready to keep going. So as, as Jim points out, there's a, 
uh, a lot of different types of root packages out there, uh, field grown. We have bare root. We have our bald and burlap container, our um, uh, grown in wood box. Um, so there's a lot of different options. We're going to focus on um, really container and bald and burlap today. Uh, each type of these really is going to need a separate specification and an approach to how you harvest these trees and how you plant them. But we'll be focusing on the two most common ones uh, today. So starting with uh, the bald and burlap, uh, this one is uh, probably the, you see it everywhere. You use it in a lot of your jobs. And we'll talk just quickly about how uh, this, if you've never seen it in the nursery, so it starts off, you have uh, trees all growing uh, together with their friends in a field. And, uh, and then along comes a tree spade and the spade uh, severs the roots and then lifts that tree out of the ground. And, and while the tree is um, sort of screaming in shock here, uh, it's transported in the air. You can see there's, it's lost a number of roots in this process uh, that are being left in the nursery. I can see this sort of still showing up, uh, those roots being left behind. And then it's lifted in the air. Whatever survived the spade is then um, sheared off quickly. Uh, and then that tree is uh, about ready to be packaged up and then put into its wireframe basket, its burlap, um, and it's dropped in. And there you have your, um, your bald and burlap process. So in this process, you can see there's a lot of roots that have been left behind. This is sort of wrapped up and as it's wrapped up you know there's actually this sort of almost like overburden this soil that sort of packs up against the uh the trunk there as you sort of package these um because they often don't have a flat top as it is in the nursery you'll notice when you're getting your trees uh, but we'll get to that in a little bit so the first thing to think about is um the time of year and seasonal considerations with um with trees and how if you follow the line that is, uh, this is based on um, a sketch from Kim Coder, and follow the white root growth line and how that line is, um, how it's actually, um, you have two types of um, uh, growth cycles. So you, through the winter, you know, after the soil begins to warm up, you um, have um, uh, right before bud break, essentially, is where the root growth is at its peak and then the bud breaks and then that's where actually leaf growth starts to uh, you know starts to peak and then the woody stem growth is occurring as well so you, you can tell there's this this cycle of root growth happening in, in the winter early spring and there's a second one as the leaf leaves decline uh the woody stem growth starts to decline you have this secondary um, um uh, period of root growth so uh, the the critical thing is really the time of digging uh it's not the time of planting so if you are planting something after bud break, make sure it's been excavated from the nursery uh, well before bud break. Um, so this really gets into how that tree is going to heal in um, eventually. So you would ideally get um, so some you know we'll get into a fall planting discussion. But you know is fall planting a hazard? You know or is it a myth? Is that really an issue? Uh, and so some would argue that um, that actually some trees do very well that you would not think of as fall you know maybe as a fall transplant hazard. Um, so London plane trees and uh, black gums, uh, there's, there's trees that typically are associated with fall uh, hazards, but actually uh, people or growers are finding that really it's not the case and they're growing just as well as in spring. Um, but essentially what happens is those trees, uh, you know, I think the big hazard is when the time of year and when they're harvested. So if you think about oaks, oaks actually go dormant much later uh, than most trees. So if you harvest those earlier, um, that you're sort of nipping them, you know, in this process of where there's that woody stem growth uh, and, and potentially even in that leaf growth. So you're actually uh, kind of limiting their ability to get those resources back into the roots essentially. So we're after the, the photosynthesis process is kind of bringing the sugars down into the roots to be stored for the winter. So that root growth cycle is really critical when you think about harvesting trees. Um, so uh, this is some research that was done by uh, Matt Stevens and Michelle Sutton, who wrote an article for Tree Age, uh, kind of combining some of Nina Bassick's work as well as uh, the director for uh, a Trees uh, uh, Pittsburgh. But they even found that uh, swamp white oaks, which if you compare a bur oak and a swamp white oak, a bur oak has a very coarse root system. A swamp white oak has uh, sort of a little, a little finer, but it's able to actually take up water uh, much better than uh, after it's, the roots have been damaged. So Nina Bassick's doing some research on this. But the idea is that all trees are a little bit different. 
uh, and how they are able to uh, uptake water. But I think the critical thing to take away is, you know, the harvest time is important. And when the trees are really, truly dormant is when you're harvesting them. And sometimes is the case where those uh, trees with coarse roots are, are don't, they just don't heal as well and they don't take up as much water. So they need more water to really uh, repair that lost root system. So you probably, maybe you've heard the idea sleep, creep, leap. Uh, this is a concept for transplanting response. So for every inch of caliper of the tree in the nursery, there is a year of deferred uh, root growth. And this is uh, a broad statement, generally applied to the middle latitudes. So if you're further north, uh, there's actually a, a longer uh, a d deferred growth period. And if you're further south, less so. Um, so if you have a two inch caliper tree, you are gonna have two years of deferred growth. So that's where that, that phrase, sleep, creep, leap. That first year you put that tree in, it's gonna just, it's gonna be recovering. It's gonna be putting out roots. And uh, the second year you're seeing some creeping, some additional new growth up top. And then that third year, you really should start to see some significant growth. And that's essentially the roots have been grown below ground. The ones that have been lost have repaired themselves to the point where they feel comfortable really putting up new top growth and they can, they can sustain that. So as you get larger trees, so if you're putting six inch caliper trees in, just you know, anticipate that there's gonna be six years of deferred growth because they have to regrow those roots um, to support that crown. So uh, there's a balancing act with landscape architects that sometimes you're trying to you know, the, get the best tree for the long term, but you also want it to look good day one. So the client says, oh, I've just paid all this money and it looks great. If they, you showed up with all whips uh, in day one and said, these are gonna be the best trees in five years, uh, you, you might get a, an eyebrow. Uh, raised at you. So think about that when you're planting, but I think the two inch caliper is really the right, um, the, the right tree size to continue going with. Um, looking at above the soil line at, at sort of co-dominant leaders, Jim uh, mentioned this slightly before, but and when you're in the nursery looking for trees, look for um, a single leader. Uh, sometimes these, these co-dominant leaders have an included bark. If you see a lot of leaders, this is probably is problematic in that the nursery maybe topped it to get a fuller crown. Uh, and then you can see a lot of included bark happening there. So it's not a really great structure for that tree in the long term. Uh, it, you know, maybe not an issue in the nursery, but say 10, 15 years, this is an example of that included bark. Um, so what's happening here is, well, this area where you see this ridge, this bark ridge, this is good. This is where actually the wood between the trunk and the limb is fusing together. So it's structurally sound here, but where it's, not fused is this what's called the included bark where you essentially see the bark growing in on itself and uh this is uh you can see it further detail here this great alex shigo um slide where where you have a strong branch connection here this is where that that that, that crown is and that ridge uh where that wood is fused together so it's very strong but where you have this included bark is where you get that failure structurally so as the tree gets larger if you don't, uh, you'll see that failure occurring in those larger limbs there. So here's an example of those bark ridges you'll see um, really for a healthy branch union. Uh, once you're in the nursery, there's a lot of great research. Uh, you can go to Ed Gilman's University of Florida website. You can just look up Ed Gilman University of Florida and you'll go right to these instructional videos on how to prune trees in the nursery. So it's not as if uh, you can if you see a great tree, you can still use it. Just get rid of that, uh, that co-dominant leader, you can thin some branches, um, looking at good branch collars. So here's a kind of before and after of that. Um, so here you can see that there's potentially, you know, multiple leader, cent you know, not, it could be additional leaders. So you're pruning a central leader. You're removing some co-dominant leaders potentially forming that are tight brought branch angles in this area. That's where that's been thinned out again, some evenly sp uh, spaced branching. And <clears throat> finally, some, you know, maintain those lower branches. Uh, those will actually self prune over time. So it's a, a, not a problem to leave those on. Uh, sometimes if you're growing them, uh, if you're heavy deer pressure as well, if you leave those lower branches on, I've seen less uh, deer rub occurring uh, in those lower branches because they don't have that clear stem to rub their antlers against. So that's another uh, side benefit that you sometimes see by keeping those lower branches on. Uh, these may be obvious, but if you notice something when you're picking a tree in the nursery, uh, crack, cracking or fungus, uh, splitting, uh, bark wounds, all these things are uh, 
telltale signs of concerns. So this is a tree that you would not accept. Uh, so don't take it from the nursery. If it shows up on the job site, this is a tree you would reject. If you're getting a lot of pushback, I think it's important to re remind the contractor that you know the client has essentially purchased a a specimen quality tree. You know they paid full price for a high quality tree, and you can ask them. You know, is this a, would you pay this much money for this tree? And I think they often get it right when you say that. So uh, just clarifying that really it's important as a landscape architect to you know whatever role you have as as the supplier and as the provider that you're really getting the best trees out there to prevent sort of that tree struggling along. Um, if you see these bark wounds that may have happened on the job site or in transport, again, that's just stressing that tree out and uh, leading to more problems in the long term. So those are just reasons not to pick that tree or to reject it. Uh, one thing to also consider, uh, not everything is about the top growth in the tree. Uh, some is just about genetic differences. Um, there's a reason uh, that I, <laughs> I don't, uh, I'm not, uh, you know, everyone's not built like Shaquille O'Neal. We all have different genetic <laughs> uh, size and uh, proportion and such, and trees have a different growth patterns and such too. So that could be the case. Uh, but often I find that when you start to see differences, uh, visual cues in a late leaf out or a regular uh, growth rate in the leaves, that uh, should be sort of a warning sign for you to keep uh, tabs on that tree. So that's in the springtime, maybe that, that tree is uh, hopefully already installed and not in the nursery. And that's something for you to monitor in the fall when you come back to the warranty period. Um, if you start to see uh, in the fall, if, if during that warranty period, and ideally I'd say this is middle la latitudes here, but you wanna go before fall for that warranty period, sort of in September. And it's important to bring everyone out there. Don't wait for that one year window because if a tree is installed, say, you know, in February and you come back the next February, it hasn't leaped out. You really can't see how, what the good condition it is. So it's important to get your warranty in there. I'd say every year to target that sort of, uh, I'd say September for middle, middle latitudes, uh, mid-Atlantic area. You have something different, I'm sure, in your area. But the idea is that you, you don't wait for the one-year period. You go visit them as they start to see uh, issues associated with sort of end-of-season growth. So here you can search that early fall color, color and decline, potentially. So the problems will really show up there um, for your warranty. Another, this is looking now below grade, and Jim's going to get a lot into this as well. But uh, generally, thinking about where that root flare occurs. So your root flare is where that taper that transition zone is between the trunk and the root zones. Uh, it should have that sort of wine glass uh, uh, connection there. And then, but if you start to see there where there's no root flare, that's a problem. And this is saying that there's something happening below grade. And that often is what's the uh, girdling root, something that's circling around there, uh, around that tree. And that's maybe because the, the tree was buried too deep in those adventitious roots that are coming off of the bark, um, a bark wood, not the trunk wood, are starting to wrap around that tree and uh, girdle it. So roots too deep. This is, a, this is something you can do in the nursery when you're looking for trees. But a lot of times the, the tree is buried too deep in the nursery. So when they excavate, when they, when they spade that tree out, you'll see they've taken up this area. But what's happened is they've actually left all of these roots that you should have gotten uh, with your purchase in the nursery. So this is stressing that tree out further from a from a um, uh, from an installation standpoint. So, you know, locating this top root is critical in the nursery. So actually, if you have a surveyor pin, which we'll uh, talk about those, you'll actually just be looking for those roots to tell where they're occurring and where those sort of big structural roots are and where the flare occurs, and then you can excavate back to actually um, get the right depth of your root ball. So you're not just getting empty soil. This also gets into the root ball that arrives on site that you haven't seen in the nursery. Um, so if you don't see that flare in the nursery, um, you're not, that flare is already buried um, well under here. And then as I mentioned before, and you package that, that soil is generally gonna um, sort of collect against that trunk there. So you're burying that, that flare, which may be occurring you know, a few inches down, maybe as deep as uh, eight to 12 inches down, even further and getting a lot less roots there. So that just tells you that tree is gonna be struggling uh, more than others, if that's the case. Um, another thing just to look at, look, think about is in a nursery, not all nursery trees start as uh, whips. 
some of them start as containers, say it's a, an unusual cultivar or something that's coming from a different area. Um, so sometimes there are, if they haven't pruned those off in the nursery, there are uh, girdling roots that could show up in those uh, trees. So again, it's important to look for those. Maybe it's from an earlier container where those uh, roots have circled and never been pruned out um, as that tree grew. So just important things to keep tabs on when you're looking for a tree. Uh, these are other root issues. Um, you have these uh, tea roots where essentially uh, there's a uh, you know, planting machine that's creating a trowel in the field. Um, as it creates that trowel, it's creating some compaction on the sides. And then someone is uh, plunking that, that, that whip down. And then that, uh, the tree, uh, the, the machine actually folds the soil in. So it's actually creating some compaction uh, potentially at the upper layers. And that tree is, the roots are actually flaring out as opposed to flaring down. Um, so you're getting these, uh, these issues with these roots. J roots is when they, you've dropped in that root, um, and dropped in that whip from behind the vehicle and it sort of drags the root system slightly before it goes in the ground. So you're missing actually a root on one side of the tree. This is a problem and you shouldn't accept that. Uh, the auger hole roots, you probably won't see this, but uh, it's, a, it's a fun slide. Uh, this one is uh, it, once you've augered that hole and planted that tree in there, the augering has glazed the sides of that hole and, and created a perfect pot for that tree to grow in, in an open field. Uh, if, and then finally, uh, the graft. I know in a lot of cultivars, you know, there is a graft associated with those. So that's actually a, a normal thing. It's not the root flare. It's actually the, the parent, uh, the root of the, uh, of the parent tree, the parent stock. So just identify that knowing that that's, um, that's normal and that's also uh, not the flare. Um, so generally roots, you know, for these smaller trees, they have a lot of, there's a lot of similarities between them, but you can see they're sort of uh, growing out, they're growing laterally, uh, but they're also uh, growing down. So you have propagation that's a little bit different uh, in that you start to, roots start to do a few other things uh, depending on the pots or how they're grown. Um, so these are all concerns that the propagation process could create other root systems than what you're expecting to get. Um, from your nursery tree. So again, you're, you're looking for those flares in these uh, trees. So what to bring to the nursery? Uh, this is if you are going to the nursery or even uh, if you're just looking at trees that have showed up on site for approval, uh, the hand fork is helpful. The survey pin is vital. This is pretty small. You can um, drag the child, but this is essentially telling you where to find those roots. You can also use it to scrape away soil if you didn't bring your, uh, your trowel or your hand fork with you. Uh, your tags, if you're uh, tagging those trees to say they're yours, and you'll take them. Uh, a white and black marker to, if you're kind of working uh, with that nursery to sort of identify a few details. Um, if you bring that small shovel, this is uh, what goes in uh, Jim's bag. Uh, you may get to my eyebrows thinking, uh, how much are we digging here? <laughs> but uh, I think this, uh, these are things that could be helpful in that process in the nursery. So as you're looking for those trees, you may actually excavate down. This is a tree. Uh, this white reference line was where the grade was. And when you've excavated down, this is actually where the flare occurred in that tree. So you had 12 inches of, of overburden or soil sitting on top of that trunk. And you can see these adventitious circling roots. They start off as these small roots, uh, but they'll eventually just start to circle. They're not actually creating structural roots. Um, so they will girdle that tree in time and cause those problems that Jim referenced in the, in the beginning of the slide. Uh, so this is just showing you, you know, it, it's, it's digging is very necessary uh, to reveal that flare, but also uh, to doing some of that pruning of those adventitious roots and really identifying where that flare is to locate that root ball high enough. Paul, Paul can you interrupt? Are you... Of course. Um, the, the, the top line, the white line, is actually a reference line that I'm recommending we put on trees so that once we identify the red line is where the grade was and the yellow line is where the top of the root ball should be. Um, and so we measure up from what we think the, the, where the grade sh uh, should be. We measure up from that 12 inches and we put a mark, uh, usually with a white uh, grease pencil, on the tree um, and then we tell we don't dig every tree you're not going to be able to, to do that but if you dig two or three in each block you'll get a sense of where that grower was putting uh, how deep the, the grower was planting the trees and let's say it's it's uh, 
that from the red line to the white mark on that drawing is eight inches, then we mark up each tree up eight inches and put a reference line on it so that the uh, we then tell the, the grower when the trees arrive, we want to see 12 inches of trunk from that reference line sticking out um, uh, of the top of the root ball. Um, and so that's why we put it up so high. But that wasn't the, the, the grade uh, when uh, the soil grade when we started digging. That would be quite concerning. Yeah. That's, oh, right, I, have that's, seen, thank you. I have seen trees that high. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is just our, then finally, I guess, how to tell if when you're looking at these where the actual uh, transition zone occurs. Uh, this is just a, a quick idea. Trunk bark is going to be unique to every tree species, but generally that, uh, that root bark, uh, you're going to see that, that those perpendicular ridging, uh, ridges that occur where that sort of those lenticels are uh, occurring. And that's actually, uh, that, that's going to be a different wood altogether than that, that trunk. So that's where you can really tell what you, what you've hit there as well. Uh, and then finally, uh, where to plant these trees. So uh, again, remember that, that how that, that tree was sort of packaged together and that, that soil has risen up there. So you never want to ever plant them at this level. That, that's a problem. I think the ideal level is really that edge of the root ball. Uh, this one, so you're planting it slightly high. Uh, but you're actually removing a lot of that soil and you want to see that flare and it's really critical so if you just do this one time you know you want to be there for the hole being dug and then uh, and how they're putting that in the ground um, this this would help them uh, the, the installer really know what you're trying to get across and also not digging the hole too deep uh, making sure it's uh, really measuring from this yellow line down that's the depth of the hole uh, if it's over, if it's too deep, you'll get some unusual settlement. And so actually really want to recompact the bottom of that, that hole. So um, if it's a slope site, just note that obviously that, that root ball will be uh, on, on a slide side slightly. So you don't want roots going out into the air. So maybe you plant it a little bit deeper on that, on that steeper slope uh, to account for that. And then this gets into um, the container world from Jim. Okay. So... All, I mean, on container trees, all of the things we talked about above the soil line apply to both B and B and, and container trees. Um, but container trees below the soil line um, have their own particular set of issues. Next. Um, so we, we need to uh, start looking at these container trees as to, to what the circling roots, the roots on the outer edge of the pot are going to do um, in the future. Um, and typically you can almost always identify the, the type of, whether it was a B&B &B or a container, when you're looking at an older tree that's failing uh, by the diameter of the, the circling roots um, uh, that you can often see right at the ground level. Um, generally that, that diameter will tell you what the diameter of the root ball was. Um, at the time uh, the tree was, was planted. Uh, next slide. Okay, so the con uh, does the container type, there are lots and lots of different container types and many people say, I, I have a container that will not produce uh, girdling roots, will not produce uh, uh, containers out on the edge. Um, and basically, um, I've observed that um, it doesn't really matter. The, the standard uh, uh, smooth wall container will certainly produce more, uh, but the dimple openings, uh, the ones with dimples or the faceted or the slotted openings um, will have maybe less girdling roots, but they'll still be there. Um, and I once got a, a nice lunch from a grower who had all of his trees in dimple, uh, a dimple opening thing. And, and so I asked him to walk out into his field um, pick any tree and we would tear it apart. Um, if there was uh, not any girdling roots, I would pay him for the tree. And if we did find a girdling root, uh, he would buy me lunch. Um, and I did get a free lunch that day. Uh, next slide. Um, there are some alternatives uh, that are, um, that, that, that are showing uh, some better promise. Um, these grow bags, uh, starting on the left side, um, uh, seem to 
if, if, if the growers working with the well seem to offer us the opportunity for less circling roots, um, and, but, but still the grower has to be processing those balls correctly. Uh, Brian Kemp uh, has been working with an extreme open mesh uh, ball um, and he's not getting any girdly roots um, along the, the edge of the balls, um, but uh, he does have a lot of watering problems and he's working on, on trying to figure out what the right uh, potting mix would be. Um, I believe that uh, going to gravel, uh, bare root trees and particularly trees in gravel beds um, developed by Chris Starbuck um, is an excellent way of uh, making sure that we don't have girly roots. It allows us to see uh, those, those roots before we put them in the ground. And Dan Struve from Ohio State is working with a, a very thick polyfabric um, as the, the edge of the container. Um, and, and he's having pretty good success with that. Um, it's, uh, and he now has a, a nursery uh, that is, is in, it has this particular um, approach in, in full production. Uh, next slide. So when we, we look at, at these container trees, um, the, the biggest problem uh, up in the upper left-hand side is that each different container puts its own imprint on the, on the, the root system. So you, you can actually find how many different containers the tree was in uh, when you start tearing it apart. And I've been sawing uh, containers uh, apart uh, for 15 or more years now. Um, and seeing you know, all, all kinds of crazy things that happen in containers that we just don't see in, in B and B uh, uh, trees. Um, next slide. So this is a, a tree I, I uh, saw it apart that had three different uh, containers uh, in it. The, the green line was what we, what we thought we were buying. Uh, container two was a set of circling roots halfway into the tree. And then the original container, which was about a, a, the size of a quart pot um, a, 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 with lots of girding roots, including one that is actually almost an inch into the trunk um, of the tree when, when the tree was, was purchased. Um, so it's pretty easy to fix the outer set uh, from container number three. Um, it's impossible to fix the girdling roots um, in container number one, um, but if you get the tree at, at that point, uh, uh, you should just be rejecting that tree. Um, and the problem is, if, if you start really looking at container trees, you're going to find you have a really tough time finding uh, uh, container trees that, that don't have these problems. Um, and so maybe we have to essentially uh, say, we're not gonna allow container trees um, or go, to, there are some growers who are, are doing good container trees, um, uh, but uh, it, we have to be extremely careful uh, with container uh, material. Next slide. Um, in the, the um, container process, um, as the, the tree is being potted up through these different so, uh, parts of the process, um, you'll find that there is often lo loose soil at the bottom of the container with no roots in it at all. Um, and then usually there is a, a band of soil that got dumped in on top of the, the uh, an earlier container size. Uh, so the the A layer is a whole set of roots on top of the, the original root system. And you pretty much have to remove the entire A layer uh, to get rid of the circling roots. Uh, you have to get rid of the C level C layer because it's not doing any, any good for you and leaving you only the B layer. Um, and I'm not sure that you really want to plant that tree after you get rid of um, the, the A and the C layer. Uh, we use this soil, this uh, surveyor's uh, pin to um, probe around in, in um, containers uh, to help us find things. Uh, but it, it, it takes a huge amount of work to find these things and it takes a huge amount of work to correct them. Next, next slide. 
Um, so I almost always find that the trunk flare is buried in a container, but because the, the uh, potting medium itself is, um, uh, is so good for root growth, usually that top layer is just full of girdling roots and those all need to be taken off. Um, so everything on t above the root flare on any container tree should be removed. And that's a, a really hard job. It, it's it's going to take you 20 minutes a tree to do this. Uh, and and I, I doubt that you're going to be able to actually get that to happen out in the field. Next slide. Um, Ed Gilman has been working with shaving the outer edge of the root balls to get rid of the outer uh, set of, of um, uh, circling roots. And this is a, a really good technique if that's your only problem. Um, but this doesn't solve the problem of the, the um, soil and roots above the root flare um, and doesn't solve the interior circling roots. Um, and though, even though it looks like you took an awful lot off of that root ball, uh, Ed's work found that it didn't make any difference to how well the tree transplanted. Um, uh, and, after a very short amount of time, you had equal, uh, you had equal growth on the trees. Next slide. Um, one of the things that we, we, we need to understand is that when you cut a root, the root keeps growing in the direction of the, of the cut behind the root. So on the left-hand side, you can see that if I cut the roots um, after they've started circling, they will just continue to circle. Um, so if you're going to cut a circling root, you have to go all the way back to the point where it, it is going radially from the tree um, in order to get uh, the root, the, those new roots not, not to circle. Uh, next slide. Um, so the, I believe strongly that the ultimate uh, uh, fix for the root system is going to be going back to um, bare root or bare rooted trees. Um, uh, uh, Nina Basic has done some really good work on dipping uh, bare root trees in hydrogel to extend the, the season. Um, Jim Flott uh, and Bonnie Appleton worked for a long time on actually taking B and B trees and, and pressure washing the, the soil off and correcting the root systems. And they've had very, very good luck. Uh, Jim Flott works in, in Western Washington, um, a state where it's very dry and he's uh, had good luck with this. Um, and the, the uh, Missouri gravel bed um, is an excellent uh, uh, way of, of essentially bare rooting the tree, producing an, uh, an incredible uh, root system that allows you to plant uh, leaf, trees in full leaf in the summer bare root. Um, uh, I've done this on some projects where we bare rooted uh, uh, nursery grown bald and burlap trees. Um, held them in gravel beds and they transplant uh, quite well. Next slide. Next, are we just, Paul, next slide or, not sure what's happening here. Here we go. So when I started giving this lecture, I basically uh, said years ago, there were no nurseries that you could get good trees from and you had to make all the repairs yourself. We now have a growing list of, of, of nurseries that are, have figured this out and know that, that if they can sell you a good set of roots, you're gonna be more likely to buy the, their trees than their competitors. Uh, this is a short list of of representative nurseries from around the country that I'm familiar with that um, have, uh, will, where you will get good roots, you will get good tops. Um, these nurseries understand these particular things we're talking about. Um, and if you, I, I am sure that in your, whatever region you're in, there will be many other growers that are either wanting to do this right or are doing it or could be encouraged to do it a little bit better. And this is where I think you need to set up relationships with uh, your, your nurseries uh, um, that you're using and working with them um, and getting them to change their practices 
uh, and they will do this. It's, this list is, is just representative. There are many, many other nurseries where you can right now buy uh, good trees with, with good tops and, and good bottoms. Uh, next, next slide. I think, Paul, you, you take over for the... Yeah, so, so this is just looking at uh, Tree Fund and the Tree and Soil Research Fund. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, just checking. Uh, there's a lot of great research that's being done by the Tree Fund, and uh, you can see a number of the researchers here. Uh, again, this whole presentation will be provided on uh, YouTube. You can watch this after the fact. Uh, you can reach out to these people with questions. Uh, but there's, uh, you know, if you want to go check out the Tree Fund website, uh, look at the research they've been doing. Uh, you can see lots of uh, great examples of people kind of continuing this. And uh, we hope that um, additional, if there's any researchers here today, that they're, they're, uh, they're also taking notes on other questions. We have plenty of them ourselves. So um, we'll keep this going. Okay. So, so that, we're ready for questions. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I'm going to, Paul, your video turned off, so I'm going to um, ask to start you your video, or else maybe you can try and start your video. There you go. Now you're back. Ah, sorry about that. No worries. Uh, so this is, yeah, I also wanted just to, to give the obvious a reference to great, uh, you know, Jim's book up by Roots. If you ha don't have this, it's a great desktop reference. Uh, this is, everyone should have this by their desk with any of these questions. Also, there's other ISA manuals and uh, the journal of uh, the Arboriculture Journal that's uh, terrific with updated research that you can pretty easily uh, read yourselves. Um, if you're an ISA member, you receive these. But anyway, so there's, this is that page that I was referencing with other researchers I was talking about. So anyway, opening the floor to questions. I think, uh, Jeff, you've compiled a list. Yes, I have. And uh, it's a pretty good list of things on here. Um, First question is uh, the harvest season, is that endemic to regional climates or is that uh, pretty much universal? Paul, why don't you address that one? Um, I'm sorry, repeat that one more time. It, uh, for harvesting plants or, or trees, uh, is, is that uh, more of a regional thing? I mean, you were talking earlier about um, spring and fall and, and such. Uh, what about uh, more tropical areas where there really isn't a spring or a fall per se, like we do uh, north here or out on the coasts? Yeah, I, unfortunately that well, I'm really targeting that sort of that middle of the country primarily. So I haven't, you know, Jim, I'm sure you maybe have more information about if there are those sort of fluctuations occurring in uh, tropical zones. Uh, I'm sure they are, but I'm just not sure, you know, how seasonally tied they are because there's no winter. Yeah, my, my sense is that the further north you go, the, the more the seasons are, are an issue. Um, and and uh, the species variation probably also gets accentuated the, the further north you go. So if you're doing oaks in, in Georgia, you might not have the same problem of doing the same species of oak in, in um, uh, northern Pennsylvania or someplace like that. So uh, the, the, the fall hazard issue um, and season of digging and planting is is somewhat species it is some you know it's going to require discussion with growers uh, they are but they like us are, are fixed in in the way that they you know they think about uh, things so it, it is going to be a learning process and a discussion but for every grower I know who says, you know, you can't do an oak in the uh, fall, I can find another grower who says it's, it's not a problem, just uh, you know, some minor little tweaks uh, will make it work. Um, uh, but yeah. uh, then some research would help with that. And particularly trees that are two inches and under, I think you're, you're probably going to have pretty good success either way. It's, it's the larger trees that I think you'll definitely get into more issues because they're just you know, it's harder for those trees to regrow those roots for that species. Next question. Uh, is uh, deferred transplant growth response the same for container and b and B? I I mean, container trees essentially have all their roots intact. That said, you are going to be cutting roots from those. So I think you'll have a better success because uh, container, you are controlling the roots that you're removing. Um, potentially than, than the B&B &B trees. 
Yeah, I think this is where you can say, okay, if I take the container and I don't, I don't modify it at all, um, I'm probably going to have less of those issues. However, I'm leaving all these other issues in there, um, uh, which are going to come back to haunt me in year uh, 10 to year 25. Um, and I'm not sure that's a good bargain. Um, so by the time you modify a container tree, um, I think you're going to have equal to or more difficulty in the early establishment period than you would with a B and B. But that's that's just a that's just a guess on my part. Um, I, and I'm again, I think it comes down to size too. Yeah, if you had a I, one inch caliper tree, it'd be fine. Yeah, I, I have severely modified. I've done things to to container trees that you would say you definitely killed the tree. Uh, I've done this hundreds and hundreds of times. I have never yet killed a tree. Um, so the trees like it when we do it, and uh, you know, as long as you water them correctly afterwards, you're you're going to be fine. Hey, Rob, for a quick second. Um, we still have about 700 people on the webinar, so before we lose any more, I'm going to launch our quick evaluation poll. Um, so if you want to take this in a few minutes, go ahead, um, do it later, and you, you can just drag it off of your screen. So just minimize it, get rid of it, but make sure you take it before you leave the, the webinar today. And uh, we can roll through these questions because there are 30 of them in there and growing. <laughs> we, we should also note that we're going to go beyond the end of this uh, while we still have people hanging in there. Um, and we will also try and... Uh, look at the questions that we didn't get to answer and and do a, uh, some kind of triage on which ones we might be able to answer by by an email. Thanks for reminding me of that, Jim. Yeah. Okay, uh, next question. Is there a return on investment consideration when using smaller versus larger trees, uh, particularly uh, numbers of smaller trees versus uh, larger numbers of, of smaller trees versus fewer larger trees? Hmm. Well, first of all, I think that landscape architects plant way too many trees. So I, I want you to plant, th think about how big these trees are in 50 years and what they, they need to look like um, and plant at that kind of spacing. So we're, we're planting way too many trees. So it's, it's really a return on investment um, way beyond the, the guarantee period. And I, I don't think we should look at it that way. I think we should say, what is the best situation for each tree that we're planting? I totally get that maybe a little bit larger tree. I'm, I, I plant larger tree, trees larger than two inches all the time. Uh, but these really monster trees, and that for me is six inches or bigger, um, is, a, is a, unless you've got a client who absolutely will stand behind that tree and maintain it and monitor it. Um, it's, it's, it's going to cause problems down the road. And those problems uh, might not show up during the warranty period. I can keep a tree alive without planting it at all uh, for the warranty period. It's just a water balance thing. Uh, but the, the, the long-term impact on that tree is going to be uh, significant. Okay, uh, the next question. Uh, um, somebody wrote in uh, the B and B root collar is too often too uh, you know, buried too deep into the into the soil. How do we get nurseries to grow proper stock? I'd love to answer this one. Okay, uh, why don't you? <laughs> well, be, being a, a a nursery grower and of uh, working towards retirement, I don't have a lot of um, uh, problems with with uh, these types of questions, but I, I will, I'll, I'll start off by saying anytime that man uh, or humans uh, interact with, with nature, there's always a negotiation whether or not that tree is going to live or not uh, depends on a lot of things. And uh, we try to do our best as a grower to, to make things grow because otherwise what's the purpose? Um, but uh, we, every state, I believe every state has an inspection service that inspects trees for health and they don't inspect for uh, the, the visual uh, aspects of the trees. They don't uh, inspect anything to do with the roots, uh, the methods of growing, the methods of harvest or anything like that. There's um, a program out there called SANC, S-A-N-C, which is Systems Approach to, 
approach to nursery, um, uh, I can't remember what the C stands for, maybe somebody out there does, but um, of that addresses the insects, the diseases and whatever else. I think what we should do is have some sort of an inspection service uh, out there to inspect the physical attributes of the trees, how they're grown, etc. cetera. Um, so Paul Reese in, in Washington State said that the politics of trees are much uh, more difficult than the science. Um, we've got good science to support all these things. The, um, it, it's really working with your local growers um, that, that you feel strongly about um, trying to set up the politics of the, the, the buying so that if you can pre-purchase trees, um, stay involved with, with the project. You have to have a good set of specifications uh, to begin with, which we just gave you um, at the beginning of this uh, pro process. Um, and the, um, but, but it still comes down to your relationship with the grower. Um, if you if you if the trees are just arriving on the site, there's almost nothing you can do. Um, so it, it, it's going to take a long term. Uh, I've already been working on this problem for 15 years, trying to educate nurseries. And you saw from the list uh, 15 years ago, there were no growers that were doing this right, um, or maybe just a few. And now there are legitimate lists of growers uh, that we can work with. Um, so. So learn who your local growers are who are doing a good job. Try to encourage them to do a better job. Uh, work with them. And you can fix all these problems. The specification that I'm, I've given you um, has a fix for every one of these problems at the job site. It's just going to cost the, the, the contractor who's buying the trees a lot of money to fix them. Um, so can you play hardball with the, with the, the grower? Uh, uh, with the, the contractor, once it arrives on the site, if you don't have that ability, there's not much I can do to help you. Um, but it, but we all have to work together um, uh, to to lift the bar for for everyone. And the bar is lifting, um, think positively. Uh, but it's going to be another ten or fifteen years. Uh, I hate to say it that way, but probably. <laughs> and I'm retired, and Paul's going to be picking up the lance. Uh, <laughs> Along with half the people on this uh, call, you're here on the call because you know you're now part of the team to lift the bar. Okay, Paul, any thoughts? Well, I mean, I, I think just the obvious one is you know, like Jim said, reaching out to your nurseries, knowing your nursery is going to see them. I mean, it's a competitive business for them. They want to be the best grower, so. If you go and you do an excavation and show their girdling roots, often they'll say, we guarantee this, or we'll replace this tree or, um, you know, so I've actually done some bare root work where you take it out and you say, oh my gosh, all of these, this one variety has girdling roots. This is a problem. And, uh, and those growers get it and, and they'll say, oh, we'll, we'll remedy this and we won't, you know, we'll be looking for this next time we put those in the ground. And hopefully they do. And I think they, they really have the best interests at heart that they really want to grow the best trees. So again, working and communicating is critical. Yeah, I, I just remember what the C at the end of SANC meant is certification. And that's where we're lacking in this uh, physical attributes of the tree uh, is we don't have a certification program. If we did, uh, it's kind of a backdoor way of forcing nurseries to, uh, if, if they want to uh, sell the trees, uh, and have, they must be certified. In order to get certified, they have to follow this criteria. And just the same thing as you do with insect and disease problems. I think a, a certification program along those lines might help. And, and this is a good example. The warranty will not solve these problems. It's much cheaper for the contractor to, to, to replant a few dead trees than to try to fix all the trees and make them so they're good trees. Uh, if, if, it was, if I was in charge, I would get rid of the warranty. I don't think it's doing us any good in terms of uh, the long-term uh, quality of project that we're handing to our clients. Um, so do not depend on the warranty. Uh, depend on your specifications to say, if, if, if we don't care about the warranty, if it doesn't, if you have, if the tree wasn't planted the way the specification said, it's rejected. And it can be perfectly healthy looking on the top, 
but if it, if it doesn't look good on the bottom, you should reject it. And until you take that attitude, you're just gonna be stuck in the insanity of continuing to redo the same thing wrong and expect different results. Uh, this is more of a comment than a question, I believe, uh, regarding the gravel bed. Uh, root issues can be observed and can be taken care of easier in a gravel bed produced plant than, uh, than something where you can't see the, the roots because of the soil. Exactly. Any, okay. Uh, this, then is there a formula or something? This is kind of the same type of a comment rather than a question, but uh, establishment uh, based on storage and transportation installation follow-up care of, you know, or I should say tree establishment of longer establishment time, something you know, in the in the process of getting the tree from point A to point B and taking care of um, does does uh, affect the, the reestablishment time. Um, Paul, you wanna take a shot at that one? It's, uh, it's more I'm of a comment. Sorry, I was actually reading another comment and then trying to, yeah, so I missed it. Jeff, what was it again? No, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up because of time. Um, you, can, you can compensate for some of these things by more maintenance. Um, you know, making sure the water, you know, you, you've got additional watering, um, you can plant, a, 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 use a, a bigger root ball, you can, you can make sure you've got the roots in the right place. It's, it's pretty clear that if uh, uh, the research supports that roots that are too deep in the root ball, that it's going to take a longer establishment time than, than the roots being high. Um, so we, we can, we can, overcome these things with, with some level of maintenance. Uh, but once you get up in the six inch range, the tree is gonna look fine. It's just not gonna grow as fast. And, and I, I've observed so many trees that I've planted over the last 40 years um, and really regret decisions that I made or, or got sucked into to plant eight, nine, 10 inch caliper trees um, only to watch a number of them not make it. Um, and the, 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 the smaller trees on the site bypassed and blew away those big caliper trees. Um, uh, just, just go to the 9-11 the Memorial in New York um, and, and look at the, the tree growth on, on those trees. They've been in a, a long time, incredibly well prepared trees, um, but there, there are issues. Um, so the, the, these, you're just not buying anything other than the gratification for you, your client. Um, uh, everybody feels good about it at the end when the project's done, uh, but I'm not sure we're, we're, we're being sustainable or, or uh, acting uh, responsibly. Um, another question is, uh, should we dig oaks at bud break? And that might be something uh, I'll, I'd like to start in on that one first uh, before you guys do. Um, I have a colleague up here in Wisconsin, Johnson's Nursery, and they have a, a chart of uh, the best times to, to harvest trees, and it's based on the, the species and the timing of the year and everything like that. And if anybody's interested in, in visiting their website, I don't have the web address, but if you Google Johnson's Nursery, Wisconsin, uh, you'll be able to search through their website and find that chart, which uh, for at least the northern areas will give you an idea of the best time to move trees. Okay, you, you got another question there, Jeff? Or? Yeah, uh, there's there's um, uh, uh, another person had asked, is the orientation to the north important? Uh, sometimes they place a tag or a mark on the north side of the tree. And uh, uh, I also have a thought on that too, and I'll just very quickly. When you're growing trees in rows and uh, each tree is blocked out uh, by the sun, depending on, on uh, where it's, it's located within the block of trees. Uh, I'm not sure, maybe you guys could answer that, uh, if, if that north orientation really means anything once it's in, in a nursery situation. 
And also if they purchase liners from, from another grower, those liners most likely are not marked for the orientation either. So uh, how really important is, is uh, orientation, putting the tree back in the ground in the position it was uh, grown in? I mean, Jim, I have a suspicion. I mean, I, I've never thought that it was that important in this area, but if you got into hotter climates, that maybe it would have an issue um, where you want to have that. I mean, what's your thought on it? Well, well, one, I think the bigger the tree, the more important it is. Uh, it's not important at all in containers because they, the trees rotate around so many times or they, there may not, there isn't a north. Um, but I think what I've seen is that it's really important in paved environments where you have a lot of reflected heat um, or a lot of reflected light. So if you're planting a tree in the middle of a very large uh, planting bed um, or lawn, um, it's not that important. But if you're planting it in a, a, tree, a tree pit in a, a, as a street tree, um, uh, whatever, it, it becomes increasingly important. And also, I think the further north you go, um, the, the more important it is. Okay, uh, is it a good idea to remove soil from the root ball and reestablish the soil profile when planting? Absolutely. Im import important to take all the, the the, the unrooted soil off the top of the root ball right down to the trunk flare. Um, and the specifications that we, we, we have given you tell you to do that uh, pr precise operation on every tree. I think what the question is deals with is removing all the soil off the root system. Okay, well, you can, you can do that. Bonnie Appleton's work and, and Jim Flott's work says that uh, you, you, can, you can do that. Uh, uh, there may be some species that I might be a little more concerned about than, than others, um, but, uh, and, and maybe the time of year, I wouldn't recommend doing that in first day in August, um, but the, uh, certainly trees done in, in spring um, and early summer, uh, you, you can do this with, without, without issues. Jim, Jim Flott's an incredible resource on, on that in uh, out in Western uh, Washington. Um, and if anybody needs, um, do I have, I, I do not have him on this, this list, but um, uh, uh, he, he really understands that particular problem. We're gonna take about five more minutes. Um, but some people have asked if you guys would be willing to send us the slideshow so we could put it on our website, um, specifically just that list and um, just putting that out there because a lot of people would love to watch this and, and have access to those slides. Okay, I know that you the, 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 the webinar itself uh, will be um, on, on the website. Yep. Um, uh, I, I guess we have the ability to, to give the, the actual slides. Paul, half of these are yours. Uh, how do you feel yeah, about it? It's great for everyone to have this information. Yeah. yeah. So I would, I would say um, that if anybody actually wants the, the PowerPoint presentation uh, to send uh, uh, me an email, um, uh, jimtree123 uh, uh, at gmail, um, or I, you can go on to, uh, I have a website, you can, you can uh, uh, find it there. I'm always happy to share my, my PowerPoints uh, with anyone who's interested in them. It's also, the, this is also uh, gonna be archived on the Tree Funds website, this whole presentation? Yes. yes. Okay, another question. It, uh, let's see, how about bare rooting evergreens, especially in warmer climates? Um, I have almost no experience with evergreens. Uh, I would say that uh, if you're interested in that, take it on and, and get back to me in 10 years after what you know the answer. Good research project, right? Yes. Hey, um, next question. Uh, cutting into the container of or root, root mass in the container, uh, how deep or should you cut pie shaped sections out or whatever to address any interior root girdling? Wow, I, if I have to plant a container tree, I take every bit of potting medium off the tree. 
just take it all off. Untangle the roots, cut the girdling roots, cut whatever you need um, and plant the tree. Spread those roots that you got left out in radial patterns. Um, I've done this for hundreds of trees. I've never killed a tree doing it. Uh, then I'm, I've, that was the end of what I had on my notepad here. Uh, there's a few more in here and then we're pretty much done. Uh, this is pretty much a, a statement rather than a question, I believe. Keeping the lower branches on the tree are important in the development of trunk taper, making the tree structure stronger. Uh, I'm thinking I'm missing part of that. So maybe that is a question and maybe it is uh, asking if keeping the lower branches on is important. But, I mean, I think it's a statement they're saying that you know, essentially it, it leads to a stronger tree by adding, you know, by keeping those lower branches on. Before I was, you know, advocating for them, um, you know, it's an additional branch that's going to, that's going to produce photosynthesis for that tree. Um, it's, it's a value for that tree. So the idea that it actually creates a better uh, flare I, I don't know that to be true, but that sounds interesting. Yeah. If, if you go on Ed Gilman's website, uh, University of Florida, he has a whole section on just keeping the lower branches and, <clears throat> and how to, you can prune them back a little bit um, so that the, uh, they're still doing their biological thing without getting in the way. Um, uh, so go, go to uh, the University of Florida, Ed Gilden, and the recruiting uh, uh, sections and, and all about that. But it's, it's very, very good. Um, a little hard on street trees, but uh, the, the, the more lower branches you can keep, the science says, does really good things. Next question. What are your thoughts about nurseries that remove the central leader and make many uh, heading shearing cuts around the crown to shape shape the tree in the nursery, whether it be for aesthetics or because it's too top heavy? I'm finding this at many nurseries. I'm thinking pruning the young, uh, pruning that, that young might not be bad. I believe Ed Gelman claimed the same, but uh, removing the central leader or central stem definitely can be problematic. Of, I've, I've seen people shearing trees just to make them look nice for, for retail sales. And then, then a few years later, things start showing up that are really causing some, uh, some structural and safety issues. And I, I personally, I don't think that that's, that's true, or I mean, that should be done. Yeah. Um, I've seen in past years where uh, we were told by uh, retail chain store uh, buyers to make sure that the uh, tree is buried deep in the pot so they don't see that little crook down at the bottom that distracts from or deter, you know, detracts from the, the looks of the tree. And I just keep shaking my head that that wasn't right and they shouldn't be worried about it, but they're the buyers and they're the ones that are telling people to do that. And if they, if you can't do it, they'll find somebody who will. There's no better example of bad pruning than Bradford pear. People will not plant Bradford pear anymore because the, the trees fall apart. They peel like celery. That is the direct result of bad pruning cuts made on almost every Bradford pear ever produced. Um, near my house in Annapolis is where Bradford pear was uh, uh, cloned. The fields to downwind from the, the place where they were made is full of hundreds of thousands of, of pears that have seeded themselves into um, the, the landscape. Um, I've ridden through there on my bike. I've never found a co-dominant leader in a Bradford pear that wasn't pruned. It's a perfectly good tree. We should reintroduce it as a single leader tree and it would be fabulous. With that, I think we'll wrap it up. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Paul and Monica. Um, what a great presentation. I know I'm going to have to watch it three times because in my house here, we have some planting to do. So um, thank you for joining us today, everybody. And keep your eyes out. Like Jim said, we are going to categorize all the questions. Gosh, 58 questions we didn't get to and sort of 
categorize them and see if we can address them a little more broadly. So keep your eyes out for um, an email from me and all four of us will work together to make sure that we um, answer your questions because that's what we're here for. Uh, but thanks again, everybody, and y'all have a great rest of your day. And yeah, signing up.